Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good to see you. Thanks for turning out today. Call is at ease for prologue. Herman Wook was a Navy officer in World War II. He left the service and started writing. He wrote The Cane Mutiny. He also wrote a number of books. And in one of those books, he offered that the beginning of the end of war, the beginning of the end of war lies in remembrance. Today, let us remember and help that ending begin. The daytime group is Sunrise, 15 November, 1965. Colonel Hal Moore, a West Point graduate and seasoned combat veteran from the Korean War, led the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment in America's first large-scale combat against the enemy forces in the Yadrang Valley in Vietnam's Central Highland. Air Mobile, Colonel Moore and his battalion choppered into a hornet's nest, landing almost on top of a division-sized North Vietnamese Army base camp. You might say they received what may be called a warm reception, and culminating in a four-day battle at very close quarters. Years later, retired General Moore wrote about those days in that valley of death. I'm quoting his voice, excuse me, my voice, his words. America had drifted slowly but inexorably into war in this far-off place, whereas earlier casualties had been light. In November of 1965, the dying began in earnest. We were the children of the 1950s and John F. Kennedy's young stalwarts of the early 1960s. He told the world that the Americans would pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship in the defense of freedom. We were the down payment on that costly contract, but the man who signed it was not there to meet us when we fulfilled his promise. John F. Kennedy waited for us on a hill in Arlington National Cemetery, and in time we came by the thousands to fill those slopes with our white marble markers and to ask on the murmur of the wind if that was truly the future that he had envisioned for us. The Army had entrusted us with the colors of the historic 1st Cavalry Division. We proudly sewed on the big yellow and black shoulder patches with the horsehead silhouette. The Yadrang, Yadrang campaign in the fall of 1965 was a dress rehearsal, the place where new tactics, techniques, and weapons were tested, perfected, and validated. After that battle, both sides would declare victory, and both sides drew lessons, some of them dangerously deceptive, and which echoed and resonated throughout the decade of bloody fighting and bitter sacrifice that was to come. The class of 1965 came out of the old America, a nation that disappeared in the smoke that billowed off the jungle battlegrounds where we fought and bled. The country that sent us to war was not there to welcome us home. Our battles were forgotten. Our sanity and our suitability for life in political and polite American society were publicly questioned. We knew what Vietnam had been like, but no one back home really did. And Hollywood, Hollywood got it wrong nearly every blessed time, wetting twisted political knives on the bones of our dead brothers. So this story, then, is our testament and our tribute to 234 young Americans who died during four days in Landing Zone X-Ray and Landing Zone Albany, and an additional 71 more in the days and weeks that followed and after, before and after, all in the Adrang Valley, the Valley of Death, in the fall of 1965. So we were soldiers once and young. And so on Memorial Day, we remember. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I invite Reverend Andres Mendoza Floyd, pastor of Most Holy Trinity Church, who will deliver today's invocation. Padre. Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day, we pray for those who courageously lay down their lives for the cause of freedom. May the examples of their sacrifice inspire in us the selfless love of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the families of our fallen troops and fill their homes and their lives with your strength and peace. In union with people of goodwill of every nation, embolden us to answer the call to work for peace and justice, and thus seek an end to violence and conflict around the globe. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Padre. And again, thank you for the hospitality the Most Holy Trinity Church displayed last night. Well received, well presented. Thank you so very much. And now the national anthem. Miss Lisa Zolkowitz Ives will step to the podium and lead us in a national anthem joined by the Lyman Hall High School Band under the direction of Mr. Dean Del Vecchio. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. Thank you, Lisa. Please take your seats. Again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today as we pay homage to those of our countrymen who have fallen on our behalf. Across the nation, Americans are coming together in houses of worship and school auditoriums, on village greens, and along a thousand main streets everywhere. We're gathered today in prayer and remembrance to pay honors and respects, and if we would be honest with ourselves, to draw courage and hope and inspiration from those who have already given us all they had to give, our fallen countrymen. They fought and they fell in steamy tropical jungles, along frozen ridge lines and ravines, on trackless oceans and shifting desert sands, and after a century of military avi aviation, like our very own Major Raoul Lufbery, they fought and fell too from the skies above. All of the above. Join us, joining us on the podium today, Mayor William Dickinson, Jr., our parade marshal, David Gesser. Father Andres Mendoza, you just heard, Miss Lisa Zolkowitz Ives, and the chairperson, chairwoman of the Veterans Memorial Day Committee, Ms. Ruth Palmer.
Our parade marshal should be well known to everybody here today, or nearly so. A native of Cheshire, he moved to Wallingford in 1964 with his bride, graduated Quinnipiac in 1966, and joined the 344th Military Police Company, where he served for six years. I think he still carries handcuffs with him. He got involved in community affairs, and after a while, he was posted to the Board of Tax Review, where he served for four years. After that, he was elected to the, to the town council, where he served seven terms on the town council. And later again, he served for 24 years in a public utilities company, corporate commission, where his motto was, keep the lines up and the rates down. I think we can all relate to that. One of his favorite assignments was to serve as the honorary chairman of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Committee's efforts to raise a Vietnam monument here at Dutton Park. It stands behind me at the north end of the park. Dave Gessert was a large part of that. Compliments, Dave Gessert. He was a marketing rep for SNET more than two decades. More recently, he has been a commander of American Legion Post 187 for many years, and he will go out of his way to do anything that can be done for veterans, as he will for the community at large. He is my go-to guy. If he doesn't know the answer himself, which is exceptional and rare, he knows who does know the answer. He's been the most magnificent mentor I could ever hope for. Any failures on my part are my responsibility, not Dave Gessert's. Dave, compliments parade marshals. After that nice introduction, I want you to know I'm not declaring for president. <laughs> Got enough people running already. Mayor Dickinson has a uh, standard he says three things, be sincere, be brief, and be seated. I'm pretty good on the first one and the third one, but that be brief part, I don't know. Sometimes I have a problem. I'll try to be brief today. First of all, I want to thank the Veteran Memorial Committee for the honor of being named Parade Marshal this year. It's an honor that I treasure. Memorial Day is to honor those that gave their lives to preserve the freedoms that we enjoy, the freedom to assemble today. And we honor all those that died serving our country. We honor especially the hundred and so people from Wallingford that died in service. As a matter of fact, each one of those people that passed and served is represented by a flag on the front of this podium. But on the other side, millions of men and women have put their lives on the line and years later still suffered physical wounds but also the horrible effects of Agent Orange and PTSD. We have a debt of gratitude to all our veterans, wartime veterans, peacetime veterans, combat veterans, support veterans. Every one of them signed to defend our country to the extent of their life. Fifty years ago, the Vietnam War ended, and the men and women that served there were not appreciated, including my brother. So today, I would like to say a loud thank you and a loud welcome home to all our Vietnam veterans and thank them for their sacrifice. I thank all of you for coming today, and may God bless all of our veterans. Thank you. Dave, 
You've probably heard this in other quarters before, but the check is in the mail. Our guest speaker needs no introduction, and I'm reminded by a good friend of mine that the clock is ticking on anything I might say up here. Our guest speaker, Mayor William W. Dickinson, Jr. Thank you very much, George. And I want all of us to thank retired Major Marine Corps, George Messier, who serves as our Veterans Office Director. Thank you, George. Rick Riscorla was a platoon leader in the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, 1st Cavalry Division, and he took part in the bloody battle at Adrang, Central Highlands of South Vietnam. George Messier just spoke about that battle. His decorations include the Silver Star, the Bronze Star with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Purple Heart, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. His character, qualities, and intelligence were critical to the American success at Hadrang. But his name is not on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., because he came home from that war. He came home to an America torn by anti-war demonstrations and hostility. It was a very uncomfortable time for Vietnam veterans. Out of the Army, Rick Riscorla was hired by Morgan Stanley as head of security in New York City. In the 1990s, he evaluated the offices of the World Trade Center and determined that the unguarded underground garage was a logical target for attack. The safety concerns were brought to the attention of the Port Authority that owned the World Trade Center. Nothing was done. On February 26, 1993, a truck bomb exploded in the World Trade Center garage. Rick Riscorla oversaw the evacuation of the Morgan Stanley offices. He again voiced concern, even identifying the possible use of airplanes as a threat. Morgan Stanley's lease term went to 2006, and no one was interested in moving. Some people may have given up at that point. Rick Griscorla continued to address the problem. He prepared an evacuation plan for Morgan Stanley employees. All employees, including senior staff, had to walk down 44 flights of stairs every three months improving the time of evacuation with each practice. When World Trade Center Tower 1 was hit at 8.46 a.m. on September 11, 2001, Rick Riscorla ignored advice to stay put and began an orderly evacuation of 2,700 employees on 20 floors of the World Trade Center Tower 2 including a thousand employees at the World Trade Center Building 5. When Tower 2 was hit at 9.02 a.m., most of Morgan Stanley's employees and others had already evacuated. When told to evacuate himself, Riscorla said, as soon as I can confirm, everyone is out. Just before Tower 2 collapsed, he was seen on the 10th floor, headed up.
Morgan Stanley's employees totaled 2,700. All but six were safely evacuated. Rick Rescorla and his three deputies were four of the six employees who died that day. Rick Rescorla left a wife, two children, and three stepchildren. Thousands of veterans served us in Vietnam and came home to contribute to America with careers, families, courage, and good citizenship, even though not welcome for their service. They embody the words of President Lincoln in his second inaugural address, who stated, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. On this Memorial Day, we honor and remember Rick Rescorla, Vietnam veterans, and all who served in our armed forces as they have lived the words of President Lincoln. May we now have the courage to live in harmony with their example. May God bless our veterans. Thank you. As far back as I can remember, Mayor Dickinson has been the guest speaker on our all-faith ceremonial event on Sunday evening preceding Memorial Day. Now you may understand why. Thank you again, Mayor. There's a banner on the stage front just below me. A gold star banner. Many of you have never seen a gold star banner before. When an individual joins the military, that individual's family is eligible to receive and may receive a blue star banner, red and white banner with a blue star in the center. And that blue star denotes that individual's life. And it's a way to recognize the family for what they're sacrificing. The red star means that that individual's life was lost in the service of his country or her country. One star, one life lost. The most extreme example I'm aware of is in World War II, the Sullivan brothers, five brothers who insisted that they would serve together in the Navy or they would, not, or would go to a different service. The Navy said, not a good idea. And they said, that's the way it's gonna be. So they served together, they were all assigned to the same ship, and that ship was lost in the South Pacific in November of 1942. All five Sullivan brothers were lost. The family received a five-star gold banner, five gold star banner. For gold star families, observances this day are at best bittersweet. They cannot console the parents and siblings who have lost a family member to war. They cannot console the widow who sits down to meals she'll not enjoy, faced as she is with an empty chair across from her own. And nothing can ease the sorrow and the anguish of the children whose parent has gone away. 
never to witness their recitals, their graduations, their triumphs, and their trials. Against such losses as these, the gratitude of a nation affords little solace. It is wholly incapable of balancing the loss of companionship, the utter disruption and devastation of lives and lifestyles occasioned by that loss. And so when services are concluded, and after the obligatory, if sincere, orations and hugs from well-meaning public servants, bereaved families will linger in grave sites marking their loved one's final resting place. Sitting on grasses now warmed by the sun, they'll savor the solitude and tranquility of the place, and of time alone with their memories as they yet, once again, take the full measure of their loss. They'll know unfathomable sorrow, unspeakable rage, a twinge of self-pity, and then they'll feel bad about that. Gazing forlornly at cold marble stones, they'll trace the engraved names with their fingers. They'll shed a deluge of tears and wonder what what for the very hard work of freedom might have been. And so we are right to pause and commune with these families and to reflect on how great the sacrifices have been. The next portion of our presentation today involves the presentation of a wreath at the right front of the stage. The lady presenting the wreath is Lieutenant Colonel Rosemary DeAngelis. She is the sister of her brother, of brother Richard DeAngelis, who was lost in the Vietnam War. His name is on the monument to my rear, to, behind me. Colonel Rosemary DeAngelis. The Wallingford Police Department will fire a volley momentarily, relax, at ease, at ease, don't be concerned, let me rephrase that, don't be concerned. Lyman Hall High School Band Trumpeters will perform taps. And now Mr. David Gady, Wallingford Fire Department Fire Piper, will perform Amazing Grace.
Thank you, Police Department, Deputy Dating, Lyman Hall Trumpeters. I would ask Ms. Lisa Sokowitz Ives once again to take the microphone for God Bless America. for Lisa and for the band, High School, Lyman Hall High School band. Father Mendoza Floyd will deliver closing benediction. Lord God, Almighty Father, creator of mankind and author of peace, as we are ever mindful of the cost paid for the liberty we possess, we ask you to bless the members of our armed forces. Give them courage, hope, and strength. May they ever experience your firm support, gentle love, and compassionate healing. Be their power and protector, leading them from darkness to light. To you be all glory, honor, and praise, now and forever. Amen. In the closing moments of the movie Saving Private Ryan, one of the leading characters draws Private Ryan closer to him. And they've rescued, they've saved Private Ryan. He'll be able to go home. And that leading character says, earn this. You have to earn this. We've heard too much about rights and rights and rights. We've not heard enough about responsibilities and duties. We have to earn this each and every day. Thank you so much for your participation, for your attendance today. Thank you for all the color guards, all the agencies involved in performing and producing and presenting this Memorial Day observance. God bless. Let's go have a parade. We're having a flyover right now. There's one aircraft overhead. You may hear it. You may be in a position to see it. Presented by the Meriden chapter of the Civil Air Patrol forming a flyover. Thank you, Civil Air Patrol. Thank you, Mr. Kenya. Thank you, sir. Okay, division commanders, start your parade. <laughs> 